Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. Renzi, in January, the Government Accountability Office released a report on the cost of operating the federal student loan program. And the report calculated that the break-even interest rate on student loans, that is the interest rate necessary to cover the cost of the program without making a profit, for the upcoming student loans would be about 2.5%. But instead, we'll be charging students nearly twice that amount for undergraduate loans and about two and a half to three times that amount for graduate loans and for plus loans. Now, the GAO acknowledged this is only an estimate and estimates can change, but that is the best estimate we have. At least twice as much, we'll be charging at least twice as much as we need to charge to cover the costs of the loans. So, when we set interest rates higher than we need to cover the costs, that generates revenue for the government. My question, Mr. Runcie, is where do those profits go? Do they get refunded back to the students who paid more than was necessary for the cost of their loans, or are they just used to fund government generally? Uh, Senator Warren, they, they do not, they, I, they're used to fund government generally. They do not come back specifically into the program. All right. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's the key point I wanted to make here. We're charging more interest than we need to to run the student loan program, and there's no mechanism to refund that money to the students. It seems to me we're just taxing students for the privilege of borrowing money to try to get an education. I think that's obscene. I don't think the student loan program should be designed mm -hmm. so that it's making profits for the federal government. As a first step, we could wring some of those profits out of the system by refinancing those loans and bringing them down to a break-even point for the government. Um, Mr. Runcy, I also want to ask about the servicer contracts. I want to pick up where Chairman mm -hmm. Harkin went uh, to ask about the relationship with Sally May. You know, we have the Department of Education has multiple contracts outstanding with Sally May. Sally May has repeatedly broken the rules and violated its contracts with the government. I'll just give you a few examples. In 2007, Sally May agreed to a multi million dollar settlement with the New York Attorney General on claims related to improper marketing of student loans. Both the Treasury Department and the Department of Education have cited Sally May for failure to abide by the terms of its federal contracts. Sally May is currently under investigation, let's make a list here, by the FDIC, the Department of Justice, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and the Utah Department of Financial Institutions. And yet, Sally May continues to make millions on its federal contracts with the Department of Education. Between 2009 and 2011, it made almost $100 million on just servicing federal student loans, even while it broke the rules. So my question is, I understand that the Department of Education has already notified Sally May that their contract will be renewed. Why did the Department of Education decide to renew Sally May's contracts when it clearly violates the rules and has done so repeatedly? In terms of um, the extension of the contract uh, for uh, Sally May, it was a part of extending the contracts for all of the TIVAs. Um, you know, in extending the contract, uh, the contracting officer uh, looked at um, a number of different things. It, uh, including that they're bra they have been con they've broken the rules repeatedly mm -hmm. and they're under investigation in multiple places for breaking the rules is have you done something different with these contracts to ensure greater accountability to make sure that they're not going to continue to break the rules in the future i just don't understand mm -hmm. this mr ronzi yeah we you know the, the we, we we strictly monitor their compliance to the contracts and we're very open to sort of looking at those contracts and seeing if there's additional terms and things that we should put in there but in terms of their performance under the contract um, you know there may be some instances where they are asked to remedy certain certain situations whether it's an employer that provides the wrong information but in terms of a wholesale breach of the contract uh, that has not been determined as far as I know. Um, and again, I'm speaking about the direct loan servicing contract, not about private loans or uh, state 
uh, laws that they might be breaking. Um, uh, so uh, based upon our, our current assessment of all the servicers, uh, we felt that based upon you know, their performance under the terms of the contract, uh, and we also felt in terms of dislocations to the borrowers because we would have to transfer 24 plus million uh, borrowers if we didn't extend the terms of the TIVAS contracts. So there are a number of things that we looked at in terms of extending the contract. Of course, if they're found to be in violation of any of the law specific that would be a breach of the contract, we would address that by taking you know, whatever appropriate actions, including termination. Well, I, I just want to suggest yeah. that we know that there are problems with Sally May. It has become public. Yeah. And the actions you're taking and the oversight that you're exercising has obviously not been enough to correct the problem. And I'm very concerned about re-upping a multi-million dollar contract with Sally May when Sally May um, has demonstrated time and time again that it's not following the rules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I just might add, it sounded like your answer, Mr. Renzi, was that they're too big to fail. Yeah. Ms. Lunan, you recently wrote a report on Sally May um, that's doing both uh, uh, servicing under the direct student loan program and, of course, still has outstanding old federally guaranteed loans. Sally May touts its status as uh, the loan servicer with the lowest default rates. So I recently sent a letter to Sally May asking for more information about its default prevention strategies because I think it's important to understand the default aversion programs that borrowers are using, whether it's a deferment, a forbearance, an income-based repayment, or something else. And I asked for data on all of its federal loans, including both the federally guaranteed and the direct loan program. Sally May recently responded to my letter, but it did not respond to the extensive data request. Instead, Sally May cited three pieces of data, all related only to the direct loan program, its default rate, its forbearance rate, and its income-based repayment rate. So, Ms. Lunan, I wanted to ask, are these data sufficient to give us an accurate picture of Sally May's default prevention strategies? Um, thank you, and it's, it's great that your work's been in, in holding Sally May more accountable, and I really am sorry that, that they're not here today. But um, it's, it's excellent that they revealed some information because we do want to have more data, but that's very incomplete. Um, first of all, by not including the FELL information, I think does not give a complete picture, and surely Sally May has control over its FELL, no worries about any kind of instructions from the Department of Education not to release that information. So that would be extremely useful information. It would be, you get more historical data too because the program's gone on for longer. Also within default prevention, um, you know, default prevention, it's helpful to see what their statistics are, um, but default pre prevention is about much more than just this cliff of who actually falls into default. We like to parse that out and see by times of delinquency, for example, look at um, similar to sort of the HAMP program, which I know you're familiar with, or one of the mortgage programs, um, how many people inquired about income-based repayment or other things, what was the acceptance rate, what's the retention rate, that would give you a much deeper picture of whether people are not just out of default in one moment in time, but over time. Good. Thank you very much. I'm very disappointed that Sally May did not come today, and I think it's important that we take a closer look at how all of our servicers are performing, but we need accurate data to be able to do that. So thank you. I want to ask a second question, that's about the student loan program. You know, the student loan program, just the loans from 2007 to 2012, are now on target to make $66 billion in profits for the United States government, just that small cohort. And let's keep in mind, these are the best data we have available. These are government data. These are not data anybody else made up. The GAO, the CBO, the Fed are all looking in the same direction on what's happening to students that are loading up on student loan debt. And right now, best estimate we have is that the interest rate that we're going to charge next year to our students is double, nearly double, the rate that undergraduates would have to pay in order to have the program break even and as much as triple for graduate students and for PLUS loans. I think it is obscene for the federal government to be making profits like this, measured in the billions of dollars off the backs of our students. So the question I want to ask 
is with $1.2 billion, a trillion dollars, $1.2 trillion in outstanding student loan debts. And a third of borrowers, more than 90 days delinquent on their student loan debt. This is crushing our young people. And I'd just like you to talk about what the implications of this are for young people who are trying to start their lives. Dr. Cooper, could you, could you talk about that, please? Absolutely. I think that we definitely need to keep these things in mind because as we extend even some of our repayment options to 20, 25 years out, we have to recognize that that then delays students' ability to make some life choices like buying a home, saving for retirement, things that we've all heard about, I'm sure, in, in various articles and reports. And so we need to be mindful. We want our students to be effective and active parts of our economy. We don't want them saddled for debt for the first 20 years out of college. Thank you very much. I see that my time is up. Would it be all right if we had a couple of more responses on that, Mr. Chairman? Just responses. I won't ask another question. Anyone else? Sure. Uh, thank you. And, and I want to say that what I see with my clients, many of whom, as I mentioned, did not succeed the first time around, the debt is really crushing their opportunity to try again. And they really are trying again. And I think if we looked at the cost that way in the long term, it would cost us less to have them actually succeed. I would answer from the perspective of having a number of new young staff in my office as well as the students that we serve. And yes, they're, they're delaying those life choices. Um, they are utilizing the income-based repayment plans just to assist them. But home ownership, um, all of the things that we think contribute to a successful economy and that we want to have happen to drive our economy towards more health are being deferred or delayed because of the debt. I would just say that it is a burden and I concur with what the other individuals have said and that I appreciate what this committee is doing to help our students be successful not only in school but in the repayment process. Yeah. Well I appreciate all of you coming here today. I appreciate the work you're doing day in and day out and thank you Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Alexander for having this hearing today. There is no problem that is more urgent in our economy and in our country. We don't build a future if we crush our young people with debt and don't let them have a fighting chance to get a start. Thank you.